Welcome to episode eight of the Anxiety Club podcast. I'm your host, Tori Levine. Today, I'm chatting with Katie Walters. She is actually a new mama that I met my second time around and her first time around in a local new moms group. Welcome to the Anxiety Club. I'm your host, Tori Levine, a former mental health worker with degrees in psychology and criminal justice. So I know the importance of keeping calm in a difficult situation. But when I had my kids, I found myself full of anxiety, constantly questioning if I was doing things right or how I was messing up my kids now. One day, everything clicked and I made a commitment to own my anxiety so it doesn't own me. And that's why I started the Anxiety Club podcast. Each week, we'll discuss all things motherhood. So join me and let's get rid of this momsiety together. There is so much great information in this episode. So any new moms, or if you have a new mom, please share this with them. Because Katie is so open and honest about her experiences as a new mom, dealing with anxiety, and the different feelings she talked about that this will help so many people. So please share so that other moms can hear and know that they are not alone. Just a reminder, if anything is really referenced that would um, you would possibly want to look up later, go to the show notes and there are links right in there to get you to what we're talking about so you don't have to worry about taking notes or remembering something with like I can't remember one thing from one room to the next. So I understand you have new mom brain and there's a lot of more pressing things for you to be thinking about. And without further ado, I'm just going to get right into the interview. Hello and thank you for joining us today on the Anxiety Club podcast. I am so excited to have Katie Walters here chatting with me. She may or may not know it, but she was a big influence in some of the development that I have gone through in the past year with really facing my anxiety and embracing it in motherhood and so on. So I have to thank her for the underneath of it (laughs) of kind of inspiring some of this. Um, So hi, Katie. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I am great. I'm so excited to talk to you this morning and have you share your story with other moms. Yeah, me too. I'm always, I love, I love talking about this stuff. I think it's so important. So I'm very excited. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, I'm Katie Walters and I have two kids. Um, Sloan is 18 months and Oliver is about four months old. And I'm from Dayton, Ohio, but I lived in Philly for about eight years. I got my master's at Drexel in Philly. I was a teacher prior to having Sloan. I taught in Philadelphia for five years, and then I came here and taught for a year in Mechanicsburg, and I decided when I had Sloan that I just really wanted to be home. So, And luckily, because then I got pregnant with Oliver very quickly, so it was kind of nice to be home. And yeah, so I taught elementary school, um, which has been really helpful actually in having my own kids and just understanding more of the child development stuff. So I'm happy I did that. Loved it, but just really wanted to stay home. Thank you. So if you don't mind, do you just want to fill us in a little bit on uh, what you experienced? Did you experience anxiety during pregnancy, postpartum, all of the above? And also let's first just start with your pregnancy with Sloan as your first time mom. Okay. Yeah. So I experienced a lot of anxiety prior to getting pregnant. I was on medication. Um, so I kind of knew that I would probably experience some anxiety. Um, but oddly for the first probably 20 weeks of my pregnancy with Sloan, my anxiety like really actually went down at first, which was interesting. Um, so I don't know if it was like the mix of hormones a little bit or just, I'm not exactly sure because I actually had a lot of stuff going on in those first, um, few weeks of pregnancy with Sloan. So I ended up, so Sloan was a twin, but before my first ultrasound, I guess the the other baby's heartbeat had stopped. So I never actually knew that I was pregnant with twins 
it was already, by the time I had my ultrasound, we already knew that twin wasn't there. Mm -hmm. So I think I expected that to give me a lot of anxiety and be really upset, but I wasn't. And then during that same ultrasound, um, they are also said they were concerned that Sloan's intestines weren't going in her body correctly. So that was, that gave me some anxiety, but oddly enough, I handled, it was like when I, when it came down to like something real happening, Mm -hmm. I was really calm. It's kind of, was like all about the unknowns for me. So we ended up going to maternal fetal medicine, which was, you know, a lot of ultrasounds and scary, but everything was actually fine with her. So they said they, they were like, no baby's intestines go until at least 12 weeks. And I don't know why you needed to do this. So that was nice, but still my anxiety was down. And then around 20 weeks, I think when hormones start shifting to, you know, end of pregnancy hormones, um, second half of pregnancy hormones, then my anxiety kind of spiked really, really, really high. So I told my doctor about it and I ended up upping my dose of medication at the time I was on Wellbutrin. So it didn't seem to help much and I was very frustrated. So I was just kind of um, dealing with it. Like I, I explained it to my husband, like, so I have this like crippling anxiety, but I also am able to like really function well Mm -hmm. through my crippling anxiety. It doesn't make me completely shut down. Um, luckily my husband's a therapist, so I have that on my side too, but, um, he's very understanding of all of it. He's like, I'm not going to be your therapist, but I'm very, very understanding of, you know, the whole process. So I'm really, really lucky in that sense. But he was like, you know, a lot of people completely shut down when they have anxiety. I'm like, no, I can really function through it. I've done it my whole life pretty much, but it's still crippling and paralyzing. So, Mm -hmm. um, so then I upped my medication got their pregnancy. And then I ended up having placental abruption with Sloan, which is where your placenta um, tears away from your uterus. So that was kind of scary. I was bleeding everywhere. It was, it was a pretty traumatic birth experience. Um, I ended up with a C-section. Everything was fine though. They did the C-section. I was stable. And so she, what, so was she, so it wasn't necessarily an emergency, but it was just traumatic. So and I think really that's scary. <laughs> it is. It was really scary. So Um, yeah, I think that definitely added to some of my postpartum a little bit. Um, but I made an appointment for two weeks after my due date with Sloan prior to having her because I, I just knew I would have postpartum anxiety. I didn't know about the depression, but I know myself well enough to know that my anxiety would be there after. So Um, in that sense, I guess I took some preventative measures, but so I had my appointment after Sloan was born and, um, I was really, really bad, really, really bad postpartum. Um, the first two weeks, my mom was here and she's like, I didn't know if I could leave. I was so concerned about you. I was like bawling because we were going on a walk and I didn't think Sloan was tight enough in her car seat to be in the stroller. Just it, it was very irrational thinking. Um, I feel you there. I yeah. similar I, things of just breaking down over, and I couldn't mm-hmm. control it. <laughs> yeah, I was like bawling in the shower. I just was so convinced. Like it wasn't even like, is Sloan gonna die in her sleep? I was like, when Sloan dies in her sleep, how am I gonna handle that? That's like where I was at. I was just so scared. I walked in the door after having Sloan and I was like, Matt, what did we just do? We just ruined our lives. Like I just couldn't. And I, the only thing I've ever wanted in life is to be a mom and have kids. It was like, not like I ever, I was so excited, but I just was like, I'm never going to be okay. Like this is not going to go well. I I made my mom hold Sloan all night long. She's like, you have to sleep. So I was like, well, I can't put Sloan down. She'll die. So one of us has to hold her all night long. It was, I was a disaster. I feel you. Thank you so much for sharing those <laughs> specifics because I think that is such a important thing that lots and lots of moms have those thoughts and those, you know, they're just convinced something bad's going to happen. I know I was very similar with Ruben and like checking constantly. And, you know, I would always, anytime I went in the room, put my hand on to make sure he was breathing. And if I couldn't Mm -hmm. feel his stomach, I would put my hand in front of his nose to make sure I felt, (laughs) you know, those types of things. So 
Yeah. It is more common than a lot of us think, but those are reasons that we should reach out and seek help. And yeah, I had not realized your husband was a therapist. That is, yes, you definitely. <laughs> yeah. I'm <laughs> understanding this, husband there. Yeah. I'm, and I realized after talking, I, I was talking to this new mom and her husband was very like against her taking medication. And I, I did, I think I really took for granted how lucky I am to have not be so supportive. Um, I just didn't even realize that, you know, it didn't even cross my mind that some, some people's husbands are not supportive of that and that we still have such a stigma against medication and um, anxiety and postpartum, like that people don't want to talk about or deal with. And it's just so sad to me. I'm really open about my story and the fact that I'm on medication and see a psychiatrist because I think that it's just not talked about like it should be. I think it's, and it's such a problem. It is such a a problem. I actually remember in my, we went and we did the um, like breastfeeding class, the childbirth class, those types of things before Mm -hmm. Ruben, my first was born. And in the class, there was a dad there or future dad who was saying, well, I don't want my wife to be on Pitocin because I have a friend who said that this and now they were just talking about the pitocin shot afterwards to like Mm -hmm. start the contractions to get rid of everything and he Mm -hmm. was like they just completely changed her she was not the same person afterwards and I'm like that's not because of pitocin it is everything that a a woman goes through yeah like seeing that and going oh my god I I remember feeling bad for that woman then and not even knowing what was to come but yes, it's so important. Whereas if you're, if you are, I don't want to like say if you're in a situation where there's not support or those types of things to help you seek treatment, but it's just to know that there is no stigma about it. So many people seek counseling, see a psychiatrist for proper medication. And I can speak to it on the other end. Whereas I did not see a psychiatrist. Now this was pre-babies and mm-hmm. things were managed through a primary care doctor. And it's just a very different level. Now my primary care mm-hmm. doctor is amazing, but still just the amount of level and understanding that they have to have about just the different dosages to help you. Yeah. Is yeah. Really, really important. So Well, that's, that's what happened to me too, is I was on Wellbutrin from a psychiatrist in Philly so I'd seen a psychiatrist, but then um, it it was not working. Like I didn't even realize how much more anxious I was getting. Um, so then I went just to my OB after and she was wonderful. She's like, let's up your dose. If you're not sleeping at night, like let's have you take it at night. She was amazing. Like nothing against her at all. Um, but I ended up going to a psychiatrist, Dr. Silver. It's Dr. Silver and his wife is also Dr. Silver and they started a psychiatry practice. Um, they're like my favorite people on earth. Just for people who are listening who are not from the central PA area, mm-hmm. doctor, the Dr. Silvers we're talking about, they were OBGYNs and they went on, they saw this really critical need for psychiatrists for women's health. So they went back and they pursued their education as I don't know what it is. Um, they did a psychiatry residency. Thank so they you. went back, they were both OBs for, I think, was it 25 years? Something like that. Yeah. And they both went back, started completely over. And I was talking to Dr. Silver, um, the yeah. male Dr. Silver, <laughs> about, <laughs> um, about this. And he said he went back and did like a residency with a bunch of, you know, 20 something year olds. And, you know, went back completely to like being paid like a resident, just completely doing a psychiatry residency, which is first of all, like so amazing to me that they would both be willing to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, they did their, their residencies and started over because they thought it was so important, which it is, they're right. But not many people are willing to do that, which is why I admire them so much. (laughs) Yes. That was interesting. And now I have found through just doing this and 
researching more that there are some those specific people in different areas of the country. So if you're looking oh, from somewhere else, seek that type of person. But I think they went and saw this because there's such a tie-in between the hormone changes and what medication can do to help you. And that mm-hmm. it that they saw that and that it, possibly people who didn't have the OB GYN training were missing or not understanding. So if there yes. is that ability, if you have someone who is in your area, I would first try to find somebody who really specializes in perinatal mood disorders. Um, um, he, just to throw this into, like to your point, um, Dr. Silver was explained to me that going into my third trimester is when he sees the most spike in anxiety in pregnant women because of the hormones. And he was like, let's, he like tweaked my medication prior to that. Cause he's like, I'm, I, I would think that you're probably going to have a spike in anxiety. So just knowing those kind of things, like you were saying, and that's just one specific example of just understanding how medication works differently in pregnancy and mm-hmm. different times during pregnancy and stuff that I think a lot of other people, not to their own fault by any means, but just don't understand that in the same way. Right. Well, let me just ask you, how did you find them? Because I found um, them through you and through New Moms Group, but just there, I'm so excited because Dr. Silver, the female Dr. Silver, will be on in a couple of episodes to discuss Oh, that's amazing. Things. So, oh, good. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I found them through, I think, I heard Betsy, our leader of our new moms group, um, talking about her. And then I, t- I was explaining when I was pregnant with Oliver, my second, that I was very anxious and I would like to um, be per- like prevent that mm-hmm. or try my best to prevent that. And I was interested in seeking help. And she was like, okay, I'm going to refer you to Dr. Silver. Um, so that's how I ended up there. I heard about it. I think, yeah, from Betsy and then from my sister-in-law, who's a nurse practitioner as well. She said some of her patients um, were going to see Dr. Silver as well. So I just like tell everyone about them now because they're so fantastic. But so with Sloan, I was on Wellbutrin. I was taking it after and I stayed on that. And then when I went to go see Dr. Silver, when I was pregnant with Oliver, he was like, who put you on Wellbutrin? And I was like, the psychiatrist in Philly. And he's like, how long have you been on it? No. I think it, at the time it was like five years on and off. So I'd like weaned off of it, gotten back on it when I was like at more anxious times in my life. And he was like, I'm confused because if you're anxious and you're just on Wellbutrin, it's going to make you more anxious. And I just like my jaw dropped to the floor. I was right. so upset. He's like, I mean, a lot of people take it if they're depressed and anxious along with another medication because it's really great for depression. But if you're not depressed and you're just anxious, that is going to do nothing but make you more anxious. So I was like, oh, great. There it goes. Five years of my life. Awesome. Right. So he's like, we're going to put you. I was on Zoloft because he he said he likes to try that first because it's the most studied during pregnancy and I was mm-hmm. pregnant. So um, we started me on that. And it was like almost immediately just I felt like a different person. I mean, it was I, – I felt – like free from my anxiety after, you know, the process of like upping your dose and right. stuff. And um, I was in therapy the whole time too. So I also see a set as a therapist. Um, I was seeing her once a week and now I'm seeing her once every other week because she's like, I think you're making enough progress and you're in a good place now. And I don't think we need to do weekly therapy. So she's like, take that as a compliment. That's good. Yeah. So I've gotten to a much better place, but anyway, so that until I was on Zoloft when I was pregnant with Oliver and Sloan was six months old, I was just suffering from complete crippling anxiety, probably from the time I was in like fourth grade. And it just like got a thousand times worse once I was pregnant and postpartum. So that speaks to me as well with how long you were dealing with it because looking back now that I like acknowledge it and I go, Oh wow. I used to like, wow, that was anxiety. That was that. And you know, you develop coping mechanisms as you're growing up with it. And then when you throw a new life into it and you don't 
essentially have all the ability of those specific coping mechanisms. Mine was exercise like that was mine. Yeah. I stopped exercising. Like, <laughs> yeah. Especially even just as an adult thing, your life changes. So mm-hmm. you're, you're unable to have those coping mechanisms and you start seeing your anxiety exhibited in different ways. So, Oh, 100%. Yeah. yeah. Even the coping. And the, then you look back on the coping mechanisms, quote unquote, that you had and they did nothing such a tough thing. And it's so tough that it's not acknowledged because it's such a just life altering. Like you don't live your life to any extent that you should be with it. So it's, yes, you're right. I love that. How you put that. It is <clears throat> definitely life altering and how you were saying how there was a complete difference. I feel that that same way as it was like night and day where I ha- now I had two different experiences but with my first and my second, but I remember like, I couldn't be present. I couldn't do anything. And then one day I was like, Oh, I'm enjoying playing with my child right now. Like yeah. at my, I, other times, like I just didn't even know. And it was, it was that night and day. So did you see anything different between with Sloan and Oliver in your anxiety symptoms? Uh, because I know I actually, I think I've said this previously in one of the podcasts, I look back and I went to my general doctor for just my checkup and I said, oh, I'm not anxious at all after Eli was born. And I look back at that and I just laugh and go, I wish there were those like in TV when you have like the little like cutouts to like the previous and after where you could go. Oh my really? gosh. How what? <laughs> <laughs> you could have like your own talking head for like how crazy right. that was that you said that before. Like it's funny. Yeah. You don't always realize it when you're in it though. Like right. it's and kind it, of. It was so completely different. Because like you were saying how you had experience with Sloan, with Ruben, like how's he, he's going to stop breathing, like those types of things. I had Mm -hmm. no concern with that for Eli. I was just like, okay, well, plus he also didn't sleep. So I always knew he was (laughs) alive. (laughs) That's always helpful. (laughs) But... Yeah. And then it just completely manifested completely differently. So do you, do you have experiences like that or were you kind of lucky because you were already, you were very preventative and you were on medication. Can you speak to any of that? So yeah, of course. Um, so I, my anxieties were the same with both of them. I always joke that my anxiety, anything that's in my control with my children, like eating, you know, anything that's completely in my control, I am like super, super chill about it. Like I'm very relaxed. I'm like, you know what? Everything's, it's fine. Like, okay. So she ate a donut today. Who cares? You know what I mean? Like anything that I have control over with them, I'm extremely relaxed about. And I think I owe that to like, I nannied new, I nannied and I babysat a lot through like grad school. I nannied for this family that really like I loved the way they parented and I watched a lot of how they parented and it, it like spoke to my parenting a lot. And I also saw some families that I was like, I could, I don't want to be that parent. So I think I just had so much experience with kids prior to having kids that anything like that, I never had anxiety about. Um, and anything that was completely out of my control, like if they're going to die in their sleep, um, that's where my anxiety lies. And it's, I'm like that with my own anxiety too. Anytime there's any issue in my life or change or anything, instead of dealing with the emotional stuff, I um, just think that I'm dying or somebody else is dying. Like that's just where my anxiety goes in general. So same thing with my kids. It went the same place. So um, I had the same anxieties. I still do with Oliver. I mean, he's only, he ju- he's not even four months old. So um, I finally am out of that like first 100 days, you know, mm-hmm. postpartum, just the, the normal postpartum, even if you don't have depression, anxiety, or any of those. But yeah, I like sometimes have to sleep on the couch because I can't be in a room with him because I can't sleep because I think I'm, I'm too busy listening to him breathing to sleep. And if I leave the room, then I'm okay. Mm -hmm. Um, cause I think it's like then in my mind and you know, this isn't correct, but in my, the way my mind works, 
um, if I'm not there, I'm not in charge and therefore I can't screw it up. So that's like the process I go through in my mind. So sometimes I have to do that because it's too much anxiety for me to be in a room with him. That was kind of a plan Matt and I came up with though because of my anxiety. So like, hey, if you need to leave the room, leave the room, like that's okay. So yeah, so, but I would say that they were, the anxieties I have with Oliver are much more under control and I have so many more mechanisms for coping with them. And I'm on Zoloft, which thank goodness Zoloft is, I love it. So, (laughs) Um, and yeah, so I, they're the same, but I don't experience them as much with Oliver. And now I've given myself a room. I think I was so anxious and I had this like anxiety bubble and I labeled everything anxiety. And if it wasn't life or death, then it wasn't worth my time to worry about in my head. That's what I was doing. So that's what I was doing with Sloan. So the difference is now I've given myself room to like actually worry about smaller things that maybe aren't life or death, but are just equally as important. Um, So I've experienced some of those with Oliver, but I'm happy about that because I'm acknowledging things in the present moment as they happen instead of letting it build up and saying, oh, that's not a big deal. Oh, that's not a big deal. And then having, you know, Oliver's going to die. I'm going to die. Everybody's dying. So I don't let it get to that point. And I acknowledge those like smaller things now. And through therapy and Zoloft, I've like been able to get my mind to the point where I'm like, okay, it doesn't have to be life or death. And it can still be something that bothers me and I worry about. So Mm -hmm. in that sense, it's different, but they come from the same place still. Yeah. And do you have any specific things other than your therapy and Zoloft that you notice is like a key changer if you're in the middle of like an anxiety attack or you feel those little things piling up? Is there something, do you, does writing it help? Does just talking help? What do you think is your key thing that you do to kind of calm yourself? So, and I totally 100% owe this to my therapist who also works at Dr. Silver's office. Her name's Virginia. She's given me some amazing techniques to use. I love her so much. I just, I'm a, I love her equally as much as I love Dr. Silver. Um, But she is really big on the mind body connection. So she's given me a lot of tips on like, if I'm in that moment to like how to recognize it and notice if my body's tight, how I can't control my mind. So I get into fight Mm -hmm. or flight and until you can relax your body and breathe, you're never going to like allow your frontal lobe to do its job and bring you back to reality and, and your logical thinking. So one of my main things is just like breathing as, Mm -hmm. as simple as that sounds, just intentional breathing and, um, relaxing my body because how she explained it to me. And I love this, this analogy so much because I could just visualize it so well. If you're tight and you're living in your limbic system, which is your fight or flight or freeze or faint, then you, you can't, yeah, you can't logically think. So it's like, if a fire alarm goes off, like they need, you need to send out firefighters to check, like, is this a burnt bag of popcorn or is it like a massive fire where we need to send out 25 fire trucks? So say if you're in your limbic system, you would just automatically send out those 25 fire trucks and you can't, and it might just be a burnt bag of popcorn. So you just need to like take a step back. And if you're not, if you're not breathing and holding your body tensely, then you're not going to be able to do that. So that, and then I, this sounds so simple, but acknowledging the anxiety and kind of like saying, thank you for protecting me. Cause that's what it is. It's, it's protecting you from something happening. And it's a good thing. Like anxiety in itself is a good thing. But when you're anxious, you just take that to like a whole nother level. So just saying, Hey, thanks for caring appreciate you anxiety, but like, I don't think we need to do this right now. So just like acknowledging the anxiety instead of trying to like push it away and push it down. Mm -hmm. So that's helped me a whole lot. Just having those visuals to me and understanding breathe, like breathing, just like taking five deep breaths instead before you worry, just continue this cycle because it becomes such a cycle. It's like a broke, I don't know if I experience this differently, but like 
it's a broken record in my head of the same thought over and over and over again, and I cannot stop it. Mm -hmm. And now I can, which is so awesome. So um, those are things that I do. And honestly, I've been doing yoga every day, even if it's 10 minutes and not, I used to think if I wasn't working out for 60 minutes and sweating my butt off and doing this intense workout, then I wasn't working out and I was a failure. So I just wouldn't even do it. Like I would just right. be like, no, yeah. I'm just not even going to try. So I've gotten to the point now where I'm like, oh, you know what? I'm, I have 10 minutes. I'm going to just do some stretching or I'm going to do some yoga. And oh my gosh, has it helped my mental health more than like any, like it's amazing how much, and I notice days I don't do it. So those are things I've been doing just as, as like helpful because I still have those same anxious thoughts. It's just mm-hmm. between the Zoloft and the therapy, I can like stop those thoughts now right? and acknowledge them. I love all of what you just said and everything <laughs> <laughs> with what reminded me of what your therapist was talking about is I read a book years ago called The Whole Brain Child. Oh, and I love it. Yeah. I, any psychology stuff I love and, you know, child development, but it's like the upstairs brain, downstairs brain. And Mm -hmm. I think listening to that before had helped me as well going, okay, my upstairs brain is doing all of the thinking right now. Let's connect my downstairs brain and do that. Yes. So, um, I, so I, that's funny. I actually just downloaded that book on audible, um, because I did when I taught, I did whole brain teaching and it's the same idea, but in a classroom and I love it so much. I love whole brain teaching. Um, and I, I want to transfer that into like my house and my kids, Mm -hmm. but I wasn't sure how. So I'm really excited to read whole brain child because I think that it's, I, I just like love the concept of, you know, it uses your whole brain and I don't know. It was a little hard because I think I listened to it when Ruben was about maybe two or Mm -hmm. even 18 months. So I think how to talk so little kids will listen and have listen. So little kids will talk. There's a, there's Mm -hmm. one for older kids that like generally starts around seven, Mm -hmm. but the little one, it's, it's just a little bit more, they give a little bit more examples of the younger, younger kids because the whole brain child and you were teaching elementary school. So the kids are older. So a lot of it was like when they were a little older. So it was kind of like, I listened to as a reserve to hold on to for the future. Yeah. Just another tidbit. If you want another book to, to read or listen to. (laughs) So which one is that? The, it's called like how to talk. So little kids will listen and little little kids will talk. Yeah. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. It's just my thing. On top of everything else with the podcast and the membership and the mommy bar and everything, I really want to start like a parenting book club. (laughs) Oh, that would be awesome. (laughs) I would would join that. I would love that. (laughs) Oh my goodness. That's a great idea. Yeah. That's such a great idea. Like, oh man. I really like that. <laughs> you can help me with that one, though. Okay, perfect. <laughs> All right. Well, we really discussed so much, and I am so thankful for all of your insight and your open and honest sharing. But let me, me I just want to do a little wrap up. Yeah. And this was something that I took into all of my Babies at the Bar, Mommy Bar classes that really helped with that community. All of the support stuff that we do with the, um, like the membership, it all came from my experience. And I know you had a wonderful experience too with mom's group. Oh, that is what saved me. Me too. uh, (laughs) With my first, definitely. And, Mm -hmm. and definitely, and with my second too, I just didn't get to go as much as I wanted to. but (laughs) (laughs) But so what is something that you have done for yourself this week? Um, this week, let's see, I, well, I took a nap, which was lovely. Yeah. I needed it. Yeah. We had like one rough night and we're honestly so lucky because when our kids do wake up in the middle of the night, it's unusual. So it's, it's stressful for us. So in that sense, we're very lucky, but I was exhausted. They both woke up in the middle of the night at the, like different times and it was just like strange. And so I needed a nap 
and I took a long nap and it was great and I loved it. And we also went to my in-laws and they have a pool and we went swimming, which was awesome. So oh, that's so nice. Yeah. Some really nice. It was a good week. So yeah, that's a good thing. And then my, my other question would be looking back, if you could give yourself advice as a new mom, what would you tell yourself? I mean, I would tell a new mom. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yours is still in it. No, but but it's it's, it's the first time brand new mom. Yeah. Um, Allow yourself to feel it. Like allow yourself to feel anxious. Allow yourself to um, struggle. Because I think the more you push it away, the worse it gets. So just allow yourself a little room. I think that's what I would tell myself. Don't try to be perfect in every way. Do what you can do and talk about it. I think it helps. Don't, don't keep it to yourself. Just talk about it. Somebody will, somebody will agree with you. Most people probably will agree with you and you'll feel better just knowing that. Oh, thank you so much. That is wonderful advice for everyone. So I hope there's definitely a new mom or soon to be mom listening who takes that advice from you. And thank you so much for being here. This was amazing. Yeah. Oh, one more thing that I I wish I would have told myself. Sorry. I just thought of this as an extra thing that, oh, yeah. so, and I, I tell my, I have a lot of friends and family that are pregnant right now or just having babies. And I was like, don't feel like you have to be completely head over heels in love with your child when they first come out. They're basically an alien that just took everything from you and makes you anxious. And it's okay to be like, I, I don't, I don't really like, I love you, but I don't really like you right now. I don't even know you. It's, it's okay to not feel that I just was completely in love with my baby the first second that I saw them. And it's not true. You have to get to know them and, and get through it. And it's hard and it sucks. It really sucks. Yeah, that <laughs> is. I think that is one of those promoted <laughs> fallacies that is oh, so tough. dangerous. Yes. Because that, perm- that adds to the anxiety or the depression and like the mm-hmm. cycle. And yeah, that is another great piece of advice. You're just sorry. I just needed to add that in there. You know, you're, this is all wonderful (laughs) wisdom for new moms. So thank you. (laughs) Yeah, of course. Thank you for having me on here. This was great. All right. Well, after listening back through this interview, it was so informational, so honest, and I can't thank Katie enough. Have you had those times when you have been a high functioning anxious person or do you completely shut off when you're anxious? Would you like to share your story about mom's anxiety? Leave a voicemail by calling 717-461-2283 or you can email a voicemail to hello at momsietyclub.com. You might just hear your story featured on a future episode. And while you're at it, let's take one thing off your never-ending future to-do list as a mom. To get the most out of the Momsiety Club podcast, hit subscribe so each new episode is sent directly to your phone. Would you like to help other new moms just like yourself? A very easy way to do that is to share the Momsiety Club podcast with a friend or go to your favorite podcast app and rate and review the podcast. These reviews help get the Momsiety Club podcast in front of more moms just like you. Thanks for listening. Now let's go get rid of this momsiety together. The Momsiety Club podcast is not intended to take the place of medical advice or therapy. If you are in crisis, call your local emergency number or the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-237-TALK. As you heard from Katie's open and honest discussion about new motherhood and anxiety, it is a time when there's a lot of uncertainty, isolation, and anxiety going on. Add to that our current state with COVID-19, where we're separated from most of the people that we love and love us the most, new motherhood can be even more isolating. This is one of the reasons I started the Momsiety Club podcast as well as the Momsiety Club membership. 
this is a group where you can find comfort from the safety of your own home with other new moms who are feeling similar anxieties, isolations, and have questions about motherhood. Come to the Momsiety Club membership where you will get weekly online moms groups face-to-face facilitated by a fellow mom with a background in mental health. In addition, you get access to Mommy Bar weekly classes and replays along with a community online of supportive moms who want to help each other. Together, we can get through this period and be better moms together. For more information on membership, head to join.momsietyclub.com.